I want to begin at Genesis chapter 7. Pastor Al told you he asked me to do this session. So if I say some things differently than you do, I'm not picking on you. He is picking on you. Well, as a young man, it was universally accepted that there was always an invitation at the end of the sermon. That's right. Never any place on a revival meeting, a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, and some places on Wednesday night, there would be a regular time of invitation. Uh, Dr. Hiles was criticized because he did not give an invitation on Wednesday. At First Baptist Church of Hammond, he taught the Bible and did a Bible study, did not typically have an invitation pastoring here. But now it's really different. Now it's like uh, the invitation is not only not used, it is attacked. Yes. It is criticized. You're being manipulative and that's not in the Bible and that's just a man-made idea. By the way, this, this idea of calling biblical concepts that people don't like anymore man-made ideas is not new. When I came to this church 44 years ago, probably the first or second year, there was a man that hadn't been baptized. I went and talked to him about baptism. I showed him what the Bible said about baptism. He said, nah, that's just a man-made tradition. He still comes to the church. He's never been baptized. He, he just, now, the truth is, if I were doing it, if it was a man-made tradition, I'd have gone to sprinkling. A whole lot more convenient. This nonsense of getting people to take their clothes off and put on some strange robe and walk out and get their hair wet and have their makeup run. I would never have done that traditionally. I did it because it was biblical. So I want to start talking to you about the concept for the invitation. If you're taking an outline, that's Roman numeral one, letter A. It is pervasive in scripture. Genesis seven, and the Lord said, verse one to Noah, come. Thou and all thy house into the ark, for before me in this generation, verse 7, and Noah went in. And his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. I would think you would agree with me that that is an instance where God told people to do something and they had to respond physically. You couldn't pray in your seat and get in the ark. You couldn't just decide in your own heart that you wanted to be righteous and you had to get up and move. You had to do something. Uh, Exodus chapter 32, verse 26. <clears throat> this is after the incident of the golden calf. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. You had to move physically. You had to go from one place to another. You had to identify which side you're on. All the sons of Levi gathered themselves unto him. Joshua 24 and verse 15, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you'll serve. A decision is required. Whether the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Second Chronicles chapter 34, the king went up unto the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites and the people great and small. And he read in their ears the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. He stood up publicly and said, here's what I'm going to do. And he told them them of the decision that he had made. Ezra chapter 10, verse 5. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear, to make a public commitment that they should do according to this word, and they swear. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So it's pervasive in the scripture. Many of the verses we can look at. And secondly, it was practiced by the Lord Jesus. The idea of a public call to obedience to Christ. Matthew 4, he said unto them, follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. Now, what do you expect the Lord Jesus thought they should do after that? Follow him. Isn't that complicated? Now, you can't do that staying where you were. That's right. It requires movement. It requires a physiological as well as a spiritual and a mental response. He said in Matthew 9, 9, he passed from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. He said to him, follow 
me. And he rose and followed him. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 30, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Somebody said, and I believe this to be true, every time the Lord Jesus called people, he called them publicly. A public response to the demands of Christ is pervasive in Scripture. It's practiced by the Lord Jesus. And, and I want you to notice this whole thing was public in nature. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him raise his hand and stay in his seat and pray. It wouldn't work. Uh, come on into the ark, at least spiritually. Be with us in spirit, if not. Calling of the disciples presumes an answer and a response. Uh, the, the word humble in the Bible literally means to bend the knee. When the Bible tells us that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, he gives grace to those that bend the knee. So you see it very commonly, but let me give you one other thought about the concept. It is a prerequisite to our preaching. Most of you know the word preach is the word kerus or keruso. That is the word for the king's herald. That's what it meant. It involves a public proclamation that required a response. Sometimes the king's herald would come and he would say, hey, the enemy's coming. Get behind the gates. Get ready. Sometimes he'd come and say, we got to go fight. I want you guys to come to war. Sometimes he'd come and say, you got to pay your taxes. But every time the king's herald came, there was something that the people were supposed to do. Let me read you what Thayer said in his lexicon. He said, number one, to be a herald, to officiate as a herald. Letter A under that, to proclaim after the manner of a herald. Letter B, always with the suggestion of formality, gravity, and an authority, listen to this, which must be listened to and obeyed. Here is, I think, a distinction between preaching and teaching. Teaching informs men. Preaching is intended to transform men. Uh, preaching, uh, teaching will fill up their mind, but preaching is going to challenge their will. Teaching says, here's the truth. Preaching says, here's the truth. What are you going to do about it? Remember what Thayer said, which must be listened to and obeyed. So the very nature of our preaching is that we are to preach for decisions. That's right. To preach for some response. Now, that's the biblical basis of it. And I'll give you plenty of time back. I owed you two minutes from this morning because I was supposed to be in at 10.15 and it said 10.17 on my iPad. When I said, I'll give you plenty of time. You can ask questions if you want. <coughs> Go to the bathroom. <coughs> Go buy stuff at the senior sale. <coughs> Whatever you want to do. So here is the caution. I have a caution for those who abandon the invitation. There was a great evangelist when I was young, first a boy and then as a young pastor, he came preach for us in 1975. I came here in May, I got him in October. Glenn Shunk always did eight day meetings, Sunday to Sunday. I got him a Monday, Friday. He drove someplace after preaching on a Monday, preached one Monday through Friday, drove Saturday to the next place. My dad and he were great friends. Glenn Chunk was the most effective evangelist at getting people saved I ever knew. He came to our little church. I, I came here in May. He came in October. And he, he always talked out of the side of his mouth. He said, now on Friday night, I'll be preaching from the Douay Confraternity version of the Bible. You invite all your Catholic friends. He said, and Friday night, the building would be filled. We'll be setting chairs up in the back. He had tremendous faith. You know what? The building was filled. We set chairs up in the back. And a lot of people got saved. Bob Jones Jr. said, I don't know where Shunk got his converts. He found them every place. You can uh, look up the sermon, The Halls of Hell on YouTube. It's not a video, just his picture and audio. And a marvelous sermon. He preached a meeting at Canoga Park, Faith Baptist Church. Our friend Tim Rasmussen's a pastor there. His dad, Roland Rasmussen, was pastor when Dr. Shunk preached there. And they had 200 people saved in one local church revival in one week. Glenn Shunk. I, was in, I went to Greenville, South Carolina when I went into my last year of high school and college and they'd had a meeting 
And Jack Van Hamby came and had a big citywide meeting and all the churches participated. And there's a lot of Bible-believing churches in Greenville. And they were thrilled because they spent all that money. They were at the big auditorium and they had 100 people saved. Glenn Shunk came six months later to Southside Baptist Church and preached in one local church and they had 100 people saved. Glenn Shunk told me a couple of things I've never forgotten. One of the things he said, he said, you need to read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. He said, the trouble most preachers is they make fun of that book and they ought to be reading it and doing what it says. When I, uh, I, I didn't participate in the answer to the question about the books, that's the book I would have told you to read. Now, it was written so long ago, it's biblical, even though it wasn't a Christian book. I mean, the basis of it, the foundation of it's scriptural. I told the preacher that recently. Uh, he said, what book should I read? And I said that. He laughed. And I said, I understand, but I'm serious. Read the book. Do what it says. It'll help you. Glenn Chunk said this. He said, you know why preachers stop going after souls? He said, they go a few weeks and they don't have anybody saved. And then they say, well, I think I'm the teacher type. Yeah. You know why people stop having invitations? They go a few weeks and they don't have anybody come forward. And they say, well, this probably doesn't work anymore. It's probably not good for this age. It's probably not good for this uh, time in our society. And they become unwilling to request a response because they don't want to be embarrassed by nobody responding. And they'll usually use rationale like this. Well, I don't want to manipulate people. If God's really working, they'll seek me out. They'll come talk to me. It doesn't matter if I have an invitation or not. Now, that's not new. A lot of our old BBF churches only gave invitations for salvation and church membership. Roy Thompson mostly did that early in his ministry, changed a little bit later on. I was preaching in Mayo, and there was a couple there that had been at Temple Baptist Church of Detroit for years and years. And the lady said to me after, she said, why do you give a Catholic invitation at the end of the sermon? She said, they're coming forward. That's what the Catholics did. They'd come forward to get the wafer and the, and the wine. And that's what she thought, and she just didn't grow up. That's not brand new, all right? But think about that. They can make the decision in their seat. If God's working, they'll seek me out. I don't have to have some public invitation where they come and go through some ritual. All right, let's apply that to soul winning. Yes. If God's really at work in their heart, I don't have to go on their door. I don't have to talk to them. I don't have to seek them out. Or I'll give them the gospel and say, now, if you ever want to do this, you just pray this prayer. I wouldn't want to manipulate you and do it, so you just pray if you ever feel like it. Or stewardship. A lot of people never have a, an invitation in church, a public invitation. They sure want people to sign up on a stewardship card. Or a work day. You ever pass out a list, people to sign up on a work day? We, we used to put lists at the back and ask people to sign them. Now we pass them around on a clipboard. We've been doing that for years and years here because it gets by just about everybody that way. Uh, well, I don't want to embarrass you if you're not going to sign up. We well, wouldn't know who's coming. You wouldn't know how much material to have and how much equipment to have and what, you, what projects you needed to have. We don't believe that any other way. We just say it about preaching. Bob Jones Jr. preached behind that pulpit or the one that preceded it in this very spot. And he preached a sermon on Lazarus. Great sermon. And he pointed out how the Lord Jesus said, roll the stone away. And here's what he said. He said, we're not supposed to be putting stones in the way of people coming to Jesus. We're supposed to be rolling the stones away. He said it's not hard to get saved. It's easy to get saved. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I didn't say Jack Hiles. I said Bob Jones Jr. Yeah. Make it easy for people to follow the Lord and obey the Lord, but do call them to some kind of a decision. So, Letter A, I have a, a, a caution about those who abandon the invitation. Letter B, I have a caution to those who abuse the invitation. Years ago, Pastor Jackson and I had, and probably 35, maybe 40 years ago, uh, we had secured Camp Kobiak for a winter retreat. Our church going, his church going. And then we got a call from a Christian organization. They said, we have this team, and they travel around. 
and they're going to be available and they can do some music and stuff and could they come to your retreat? And we rather unwisely said, oh, okay. So they came. They thought they were running the whole thing. We said, no, we were on the retreat. You can just preach and sing. And so the preacher from that group got up and the first sermon was really hilariously funny. Just really, really funny. I didn't give an invitation. Just kind of messed around. And the second sermon, he just kind of messed around and he said, I don't know about you, but I like to fellowship a little bit and get to know the kids. I said, okay. The third sermon, he dropped a bomb. And I mean, he ripped face. And you had two choices at the invitation. Come forward or you are a total reprobate. That's all you could do. And not everybody came forward. And he said, if I'm any discerner of spirits, you got some problems around here. He was a man very convinced of his own opinions. My wife and I did not have children at that time. And he asked me if I had children. I said, no. And, and uh, I, I said, our, our position is, our spirit is, if the Lord wants to give us children, we'll be grateful. If he doesn't, we're still okay. We have each other. He said, that may be your position. I'll guarantee it's not your wife's. And I was amused at how much he knew about my wife, having never met her until that retreat. And how much more he knew about her than I did. But you've all been there. How many of you say, I want to be a better Christian. Yeah. Oh, not me. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be a worse Christian. If you want to be a better Christian, come forward. We call those, if you love your mother, invitations. Yeah. <laughs> now, I think there may be in a time and a place where you say, you know what, I want you, everybody who's willing to come to the altar and pray for some unsaved people. We're going to pray together that God will convict their spirit and, and, and work in their heart and we can give them the gospel and be saved. I think it's fine. That's more of a corporate prayer time, really, than it is an invitation. Uh, I know one preacher, he's not preaching as much as he used to, but he preached around a lot. And uh, Steve Pettit was on our staff then, and he went to the meeting the guy was preaching, and he came back and he said, well, he said, we're taught there's two times to respond to the invitation. Number one, when you're convicted, and number two, when you're not. Yeah. Okay. So the rationale was, if God spoke to you, you ought to come, and if he didn't, there's something wrong with him. So you ought to come. What that meant was everybody should come to the altar every time. That is kind of like a Catholic ritual. That's not responding to the Spirit of God. All of you want to love God more? Come. So those, there are those abuses. Here are my comments. Here are my suggestions about it. Number one, or letter A, prepare the invitation as you prepare the sermon. My dad taught me this. He said, you need to know what you want the people to do when you're done preaching. That's right. What's the point? If I'm a king's herald, I'm calling them to action. What is it I want them to do when I'm done? Prepare the invitation as you prepare the sermon. Next suggestion is this. Preach for a verdict. Brother Rick Flanders, Dr. Flanders, a member of our church here. And I'm honored to be in the same church with him. I was his pastor for some years <coughs> before I resigned from the pastor. And Rick Flanders preaches like a country lawyer. He kind of builds his case one point at a time from the scripture. And it may not seem really always dynamic or bombastic at first, but when he's done, you can't argue with him. That's right. You can either obey or disobey. You can do what you're told to or not do what you're told to. You can't argue with it. The whole sermon is designed to get people to make some step forward in their Christian life. Next number is this. Expect God to work. Brother Myra referenced Charles Spurgeon. How many of you thought he looks like Charles Spurgeon? He looks like Charles Spurgeon. He was born on the same day as Charles Spurgeon. And... <coughs> Titus Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was 5'8", but the marble would be 5'9 or 10. And, uh, but he's not. Charles Spurgeon was 5 feet 8 inches tall and had a 58 inch waist. And uh, by the way, I, I preached for Brother Morrow. Uh, he's got a wonderful church. I hope you get to know him. Little town, less than 100. Way up in the north woods of Wisconsin. I'll tell you a story because it's impressive. He uh, 
He and his wife, Angela, got married. He didn't know, but she had a little money. Her stepdad had been killed in a helicopter accident in the Army, and the U.S. government gave her a settlement. They were working in Mississippi as an assistant pastor, being raised in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. His dad was living way up in the woods in Wisconsin, and he always felt God wanted to start a church there. So his dad said, son, there's a school building that's going up for auction here. And he said, well, go ahead and bid on it. There was one bid. There's the opening bid. You got a good, solid school building for $20,000. They just spent $20,000 doing some work on the sewer system. And uh, <coughs> he said, uh, there's a double wide on five acres of land. You might want to live in that. He said, okay, go ahead and buy it. So his money, his wife's money, bought the church building, bought the house, and he drove from Mississippi to Wisconsin, never having seen the building in which he was going to start a church or the home in which he's going to live. Didn't see if they got there. Great, great faith. Wonderful church, bus minister, Christian school, great people, solid young people's own kids are great. And I appreciate his honesty and transparency. We're riding the car. He said, you got a chapter of depression in your book. What's your take on that? And I'm glad the first words I said were, well, it's a real deal. Now, I've never been troubled by it. I'm just not made that way. But I can't take any credit for that. He goes, well, I'm not that way. If you're right with God, you never be that way. Well, I've never had cancer either. <laughs> Some of you never went bald. You say to me, Brother Let, just brush your hair. It'll grow. I brush mine and it grows. And that's a real deal. He's a great man. But he talked about Spurgeon. Spurgeon had a young man come to him one time and he said, uh, he said, I'm, I'm bothered. He said, uh, I'm not seeing people respond to my sermons like I like. I'm not seeing people save uh, like I'd like to when I preach. And, and Spurgeon, Spurgeon said, Well, you don't expect people to get saved every time you preach, do you? And he said, Oh, no. He said, that's why they don't. I've done this in another setting. Uh, let, let me do it in this one and to see if I can give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. What are you doing? Uh, you put your hand up. You're, you're shaking my hand. This is Brother Sturgeon, not Spurgeon. Sturgeon. And I'm trying to teach this lesson, and you're shaking my hand. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? You, you said it a minute ago. Because you put your hand up. put your hand out. <coughs> you normally don't shake hands with people while you're doing a lesson. <coughs> it's not a typical thing. <coughs> Excuse me. But most people will do what you expect them to. And you communicate your expectations in a thousand subtle ways. Sometimes we don't expect people to come to church after they get saved. <coughs> and we kind of communicate that. Our spirit, our attitude. And so, so expect people to respond. Prepare the invitation as you prepare the sermon. Know what you want them to do when you're done. <coughs> Preach for a verdict. Expect people to respond. Next number, a letter. Lead the people one step at a time. Lead the, spe the people <coughs> one step at a time. Lord Jesus said, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them yet. Let's say I, I'm not sharing the gospel, I, I, but Treadway agrees to trust Christ. I said, man, I'm glad you got saved. Now, you need to come to church, you need to get baptized, you need to join the church, you need to stop going to movies, you need to stop smoking cigarettes, you need to stop drinking booze, you need to read the Bible every day, you need to pray. And if you've got 10% of your income plus a missions offering that we have, we've got a camp meeting where we want you to be at every service of that. How do you think that's going to work? We just got saved. <coughs> he is, by definition, a baby Christian. You know, babies do. They eat, sleep, cry, and mess their bridges. That's what they do. Every step of growth in their life is encouraged and enabled by their parents. And most parents don't expect them to take out the trash the day after they bring them home from the hospital. They wait till they grow to a certain point. So take them one step at a time. I like the idea of having people bow their heads. I like the idea of having them raise their hand if the Spirit of God has spoken to their heart. I like the idea of after that, having a time they can come to the altar and do business with God. 
lead people one step at a time. Letter C, or uh, I have some extra ones. So whatever letter it is, number now, my outline is A, B1, B2, B3, and C, because I added some things. But the next, next letter and number, be specific rather than general. Be specific rather than general. There are invitations to which most people should respond. Doesn't mean they will. I preach a sermon sometimes on lukewarmness. I ask the people at the beginning of the sermon, before I read the text, they got a piece of paper. I say, please make a mark on the right side of the paper and on the left side of the paper. If you don't have a piece of paper, do this in your mind. I say, uh, let the mark on the right side of the paper represent a great Christian, best Christian you know on a scale of one to ten. Let the mark on the left side of the paper represent a lousy Christian, worst Christian you know. And then I say, put a mark on the paper where you think you are in your Christian life and fold up the paper and let's read the scripture. When I preach the sermon and go through the text on lukewarmness in Revelation 3, I will then say at the invitation, how many say, I know I'm not perfect, I'm not saying I couldn't improve, but I think the Lord would say I'm a hot Christian. I think there are people like that. I think people like that in this room. Raise your hand. Now I say for the rest of us. That would mean that you're either a lukewarm Christian or a cold Christian. How many would say, I do not want to be the kind of Christian that makes my Savior sick to his stomach. And by the grace of God, I want to begin today the journey from where I am to where God wants me to be. That's a very specific statement, but it would apply to most people in the invitation. There's some invitations most people should respond. They may not all respond. But it's specific. It's not if you want to be a better Christian. If you think your life with God and your walk with God could improve. Yeah. Later, next, next number. Encourage, but do not manipulate. Amen. I hear people were very responsive, and I didn't do this when I was here. When I travel out, I usually do this to the musician. And tell them not to start playing. I'll say... In a moment, I'm going to ask the musicians to begin to play. When I give them the signal, they begin to play. That's your signal. If you lifted your hand, meant business about it, or you didn't, but you should have, just slip out of the seat and come to the altar and do business with God. Now, I, <coughs> I think that's reasonable. I think that's fair. I have heard people say... <coughs> The aisles will be full as most of you are coming down. If you can't get to the altar, just trying to see. Come, come, come right now. Come, come. I don't know. I want to encourage them to obey God. That I want my, I hope they are. I want my invitations to be clear and plain. Yes. Not a big, either God spoke to you or he didn't. Either you're going to obey him or you're not. I want to encourage but not manipulate. Okay. Uh, be willing to vary the way you give the invitation. You know, one of the things I learned a little later in our time here, we, our theme one year was revive us again. Well, not revive us again. And we prayed and worked and asked God for revival. I'd been at Faith Music Missions doing a CD. My brother David Chamberlain's their piano player and does all the arrangements. And Brother Ed Russ, who leads that wonderful ministry, said, we like using David, not other people's piano players, because he knows what he's going to do when he does the arrangement. He leaves holes for the other instruments. He leaves a place for the violin or the trumpet or whatever is going to be in there. And that made me think, we have our sermons so structured and so organized, there's not a lot of room if God wants to do something different. Here's one of the things I did. I preached series much of the time that I was here, and I would never decide how far I was going to get in the series on a particular service. I didn't care if I got one point, three points. And if God led us to just stop and pray, I wanted to stop and pray. If I thought we should have testimonies, I wanted to have testimonies. I want to leave holes for God to work. I wanted to feel like God was in charge of the service. I got a general idea what's going to happen, but he can move me any way he wants me to. You want to be careful the invitation is not so rote and rigid that there's not room for God to lead you to do something different. Sometimes I don't even do the music. People are seated. I raise their hand. I say, okay, you raise your hand. Just come right now. I think that cultivates the habit of, of immediate obedience to the Spirit of God. 
I was in a bowling alley with my dad years ago talking about an evangelist who was then a member of our church and we are going to take an offering for him that night and dad said, is he having a hard time? I said, yeah. My dad didn't have any money at all at that time, but he pulled out his wallet and he had a $50 bill he tucked away for emergencies and hidden from my mother. And he said, here, give him this. I said, dad, you don't have to do that. We're going to take an offering for him. He'll be all right. And dad said, no, son, I learned a long time ago. I must obey the impulses of the Holy Spirit immediately. Or I will talk myself out of them after a while. Sometimes maybe it's good to give your people an opportunity to obey the impulse of the Holy Spirit immediately. Sometimes I don't have people raise their hand. Sometimes I get in preaching and say, okay, the altar's open. If you need to do business with God, you come. Be willing to vary the way you give the invitation. Next letter, consider offering an alternative. Uh, you have a church with older members. I preached at a church on Sunday. The preacher said, most of our people are 65 or older. He's working on reaching new people. He's doing a wonderful job and getting some younger folks in. But do you know some of those people barely got into the pew? There's one dear old lady. She's a founding member of the church. She and her husband have been there 61 years. Great Christians. And she was in a walker after the service, and they helped her get up to go to her car. And she says, oh, I don't think she's going to come kneel at the altar. I do think God could still work in her heart. So sometimes after I've asked people to come forward, I'll say, if you want to pray and make an altar of your seat, I'm okay with that. Now, by the way, if everybody else is standing and you're either sitting or kneeling, that's still kind of a public invitation. Not real critical of that. Consider offering an alternative. My final thought is this, be guided by the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm going to get in trouble here. We've had a lot of special speakers at our church over the years, and, and it is a good chunk of them that travel all the time. And what they do is they have their program all figured out. And they come into your church and run their program. It may help, it may not. Years ago, we had a wonderful evangelist. I love him dearly. I pray for him daily. And he always got great crowds. And I said, brother, our burden this year, our heart is for revival. We really want to see God revive our church. We're glad to see people say, we think we'll see that. We really want to see revival. And it's interesting. I had two evangelists who didn't like that when I said that to them. It was amusing, intriguing to me. So he said, all right, Sunday morning he got up and he preached the exact same message he had preached a couple of years earlier when he'd been there for a meeting, exact same. And I said, hey, you know, you preached that message last time you're here. If he had said, I know that, but I really felt this was the Lord want me to do, I'd been okay. Here's what he said, ah, they won't remember it. So I concluded what he's doing is just coming and running his program. We had an evangelist one time. He was a wonderful evangelist, great evangelist, great guy. The week after he was to be with us, he was preaching at a church that he'd preached at every year consecutively for 20 plus years. And he did something a little different. He preached all of his sermons were a series out of the same book of the Bible. A little unusual, not wrong. They were good, but I'd heard him other times and I'd heard a lot of other sermons of his that I thought were better. You want to know what I found out he was doing? He was preaching a series of sermons for us that he's going to preach to that other church the next week. He was practicing them on us. We got his trial run. I think one reason the Lord lets me go a lot of places is because I genuinely try to help the preacher and help the church. Amen. I'll say to the preacher, what is your burden for this meeting? How many of you knew who Brother Hiles was? Knew anything about Dr. Jack Hiles? You know Dr. Hiles. Nobody tells me what to preach. Yeah. First time I had Dr. Hiles preachers, I think 1977. We had a cancellation in the schedule. We got him for three week notice. We got him in. And uh, I'm nervous as can be. So if it's 77, I'm uh, 24, 25 years old. And I pick him up in the car and he says, now, Brother, will that? 
Are there any of my sermons that you've heard me preach somewhere that you think would help your people? That you'd like me to preach? I'm like, wow. Nobody tells me what to preach. I said, oh, blah, no, 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 brother house. <laughs> yes, whatever you want to preach. And then he said, now, brother Lett, are there any of my sermons that you might have used that I should avoid? That was a really good question. <laughs> At first I said no, and then I remembered one. I said, yeah, you probably shouldn't preach that sermon, So Great Salvation. He came in to help. I have many times gone to the pulpit with a sermon in my Bible that I thought I should preach. And because of something somebody sang, because of what a previous speaker said, because of something that some of the preachers said, God said, no, you preach that sermon. And you know what? I've never changed like that and been disappointed. That's right. <laughs> been disappointed many times when I took the one I thought was really going to be good. And it, my sermons are always really, really good when I write them. <laughs> Something happens to them between my desk and the pulpit. I'm not sure what it is, but a lot of them just disintegrate and deteriorate along the way. But be guided by the Holy Spirit. So, in essence, I'm saying to you, God always makes people publicly respond. The idea of preaching requires a public response. And we ought to construct our sermons so that when we're done, we know what we want the people to do in regards to the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor, I'm done. You can do anything you want. Sure. Anybody have any questions? I have an answer for every question. The answer is usually, I don't know. If I don't know, Pastor Howell will know. All right. Da, 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 da. When people have no questions, it is either because the material was so well covered that there's nothing left to be said or so poorly presented nobody can even understand what he's talking about. Brother Hobbins. What do you sense is the motivation behind the trend to go away from the invitation? It's all part of the seeker-sensitive movement. Yeah. We don't want to do anything that makes anybody uncomfortable. And so we're not going to preach directly to them. We're not. Now, parts of it are good. Here's how I used to recognize visitors. All the visitors, please stand. I found out later not everybody liked that. So then I'd have our people stand and the guests remain seated and they bring them a card. And I think we still do something like that. And that was, we call them guests now, not visitors, because visitors, just somebody popped in, guests are welcome and invited and cared for. But, but I think it's all, I sort of think it's fine to be considerate in that regard. I think it's good to have padding on the pews and lights and air conditioning and all that sort of stuff. But when it comes to God working on people's hearts, I think we want to challenge people because that's what we find in the scripture. So I think it's all driven by, but two things. The one is nobody's responding, so I just don't give one. And the other is, well, you know, we, we don't want to put anybody on the spot. I go places and they say, now brother, well, that, I usually have people pray in their seat. So that's what I do. I'm there to help him. Unless God really specifically told me something else, I'd say, okay, you can pray in your seat. I sometimes, uh, maybe, well, I don't know, maybe three or four times a year, I'd give a public invitation for people to be saved. And then I would say, if you're here today, you don't know you have a home in heaven, you can know, I'd give them the gospel. And I'd say, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer from your heart to God. Saying the words doesn't save you, meaning what they say will save you. And I'd have them pray, and then I'd say, if you prayed that prayer, raise your hand. That's what I do at funerals. That's what I've done at weddings. And so I'd occasionally add that to the regular invitation at the end of the morning service. Uh, but, I, but I think it's largely driven by embarrassment that nobody's coming and the idea that you shouldn't do anything that offends anybody or puts anybody on notice. It's kind of against the who is on the Lord's side deal. 